All righty. Hi, everybody, and welcome officially to week eight of the Nebula Cohort Call. My name is Gift. Or you can call me Gigi, which is more preferable. I'm an internal journalist at Absalon, a data science consultancy where I basically create technical content. And I was a part of OLS 7 as a mentee where I worked on a project on AI ethics. And I'm your facilitator today alongside Irene. And while we are about to get started, please make use of the Ramapad. The link is in the chat. And Irene, I'll hand over to her in a second. She'll be telling us more about the session and our speaker is already here. So if for any reason you can't use the Frama pad, please use the Zoom chat and we'll copy your responses over to the pad. And we have two reminders. We have the code of conduct that applies to this call. And if you need for any, for any reason to report anything, you can um, email the directors at OLS. Then also another reminder is indicating your preference if you want to be a part of written or spoken breakout rooms with a W or an S. So please edit your name by clicking on the dots on the top right of your Zoom box. It, it, it looks different if you're using your phone or your PC. And just add the W or the S in front of your name if you want to be part of a, speak, a spoken room or a written room. Then um, I think at this point, everybody's used to the usual code of conduct that we have. So I won't bore you with all that stuff, but then I'll hand over to you right now if you would prefer to go over it because yeah, okay. I'm done talking. Yeah, thank you, Jenny. It's great having you here. Um, so today we have Aman, and um, this session is very practical. We're going to be uh, kind of going over and kind of putting together several concepts that we have been uh, learning about with Johanna in the previous session about code, but also um, a quick, quick reminder and activity about licenses, documentation, um, and how they apply specifically to code. So I'm going to pass it over to Aman um, to get us started with the presentation. Hi, folks. Uh, nice to be here. I'm excited to be here for another Nebula cohort. Uh, yeah, it seems like we just got done with the first one, but uh, excited to see fresh faces. Uh, I'll just share my screen and yeah, as Gigi and Irena said, we'll be going over some programming best practices today. Apologies for my sore throat. So might be a couple of hiccups here and there, but should be smooth overall. Uh, I'll just share my screen and if people are able to see it, is that visible? Perfect. I see a hands up, a thumbs up. Okay. Let's get to the slideshow. Yeah, all right. So welcome everyone to session eight of uh, the Nebula cohort. Uh, I'm Aman and today we'll be talking about programming best practices. We'll be particularly looking at readme files and licensing among a few things. We'll be generally talking about how we organize our projects and how we document things. So we'll touch little bits and pieces which you might be familiar with, which might be completely new to you as well. And we'll look at some quite exciting stuff. So just to get on a brief introduction about myself, who I am. So I'm a research software engineer uh, at the University of Manchester. And I'm a com I like to believe that I'm a community builder and open science enthusiast. And then I also like to do quite a lot of training. So I think I got involved with OLS uh, in OLS 6 as a mentee. And uh, ever since I've been involved with the community in different capacities. So I've done some facilitation, some uh, coaching, and yeah, also some mentoring recently. So yeah, uh, happy to be here always as a speaker. Uh, I have a background in computer science. And again, I'm generally an enthusiast about anything and everything sort of open science and community. So uh, I'm a fellow with the Software Sustainability Institute, which is a UK-based institution uh, that works on a lot of research software stuff. Uh, you might find that interesting if research software is one of your areas of interest. So they work on, again, open source, research software, open science. So there, there are like quite a few overlaps with OLS. You might come across their name because I think we have some collaborations with them as well between OLS and SSI. 
but anyway uh that's kind of a brief about me uh so objectives so today's talk we'll talk about as we said we'll talk about okay how we take the considerations when we plan a new open software project so here we mention open software projects but it is more general it doesn't have to necessarily be a software project but we kind of say it is a software project because uh the call is about open code uh technically but it can be a community project it can be a non coding project altogether it can be something different which which uh, i think still gives us that intersection of yeah software projects and community projects in general but the key focus is open science as always uh we will look into readme files we'll fig uh, we'll look at what readmes are and how we navigate them and what's what it's all about so again as i said there might be things during the call which some people might be familiar with or it might be completely new uh do let me know if something feels too jargony or too technical or too just yeah uh kind of yeah unknown and i'd be more than happy to clarify so feel free to please put in the chat raise your hands or even on the notes because as as a software engineer i think i do have the tendency to sometimes get too technical without realizing so yeah please feel free to tell me even to slow down or to repeat myself and uh yeah there's this I'll, i'll try to keep it as general as possible so yeah even with the speed as well i think there are reactions on zoom from what i remember which have uh yeah there are like the slow down and the speed up reactions which yeah feel free to use anything but yeah let me know anyway moving on so after read me we'll do a short exercise around read me and then we'll look at licensing so again licensing is an important part of any project in general and how we proceed and how we kind of yeah distribute whatever project we're working on and then we'll just look at yeah general best practices so we'll not get into too many technicalities i think uh, there is there can be a lot of just different aspects but we'll try to focus on two major aspects of uh, the open code team and hopefully that would be helpful so first question how do we plan for making code or again uh to better put it how do we plan for making just an open science project and when starting a research project it is useful to answer the following questions so i think some of these things you might have already looked at or talked about in previous calls where we talk about okay what is the problem we're trying to solve that's i think the key question so if we have a project if we have some open software if we have some community solution we look at okay what's the problem that we are trying to solve and are people facing that problem and then we look at are there any existing solutions to that problem so that's i think uh, a good way to kind of approach a problem where we first look at what our problem is what it's trying to uh, what what area is the problem trying to focus at and then looking at are there any existing solutions because a lot of the times especially uh, in open science and open source communities there are a lot of things that people are building in the open which might be a good use of uh just yeah resources it, it might be a good intersection with the problem you're trying to address so that's always i think a good way to go about it and then the third point is again did you find code close to that what you want to build uh which didn't meet your needs again extrapolating that did you find a community which is already addressing something you're trying to build is there a solution that is already there but it didn't quite fit your need and maybe you could adapt that maybe you could look at something different or if it's completely unique that might also be the case you could start from scratch so th- these are a few things i think we can think at the start of a research project now potentially if there are existing solutions you could contribute to them you could contribute to whatever exists or if there is a big project or a small project uh to look at and to help build that instead of building something completely new but there still might be good reasons to develop your own code and your own project so again one uh, major thing is that you might come across a project in which say the code is written in a different programming language altogether which you're not familiar with 
or it might be addressing something slightly different, which which you could you want to adapt to your problem. Uh, another thing might be the license is not open enough. So we'll be talking about licenses later in the call. And licensing, uh, as the name suggests, is basically the documents that dictate the use of a project. So distribution of a project and how it can be adapted or reused or taken forward. So for example, on these calls, when we look at our framapads, we have the CC by four license, I think, which is an open license. So because this is an open science program, we focus on a lot of open licenses, which means, yeah, that folks are, uh, yeah, free to use, reuse, and kind of, yeah, share whatever, whatever we talk about, whatever resources we build together and bring it to the larger community. And another, another thing that you might come across that, yeah, you want to just try new techniques to develop a deeper understanding. So again, even if a solution or a project might already exist, you might want to just sort of reproduce it or again, kind of just go through the whole thing again to get a better understanding of it. So there, there could be potential, uh, many potential reasons. These are not exhaustive, but these might be a few of them why you might choose to, yeah, uh, make make your own code or make your own project or maybe contribute to an existing solution. So starting a new project, again, these might be things you might have considered, but if not, uh, again, from, from especially a coding perspective, these are a few things I think we do at the beginning of a project. So first, say we did the problem defining and kind of having a rough idea of what we're addressing and how we're addressing it. But when we get to the practical bits, we look at the scope of the project. So we look at, okay, what is the scope? What, what audience is it addressing? Who will it help and who is facing the problem? What will be the primary features? What will be the limitations? So you, you have to be somewhat, I think, uh, practical with it, wherein you think about, okay, what is the solution? But then you also have to, it's kind of like, yeah, thinking in advance of, okay, this is the solution, but also to be aware of, oh, your solution might not say address every part of the problem, or even if it might, it might still have limitations. So there might be certain aspects which you can't, which you don't have the scope for. So for example, if you need to affect a policy change, which which might be say at a higher level than you are building the community project at, that might be something out of the scope for say the initial part of the project. So the scoping I think is a important requirement to just kind of, yeah, have an idea of, oh, how big or small the project would be, how much, uh, yeah, how, how you could address things throughout the project. Then the second thing would be to consider resources. So from a software perspective, it would be the resources required to run the software, but in, in a general project, it might be resources in general. So it would be, say, if you are building a community project who who are the people who are involved with the project, who will be the team, who will be the community. So those are things to address, but also then kind of just the tangible resources, uh, say in terms of, okay, you need an internet connection, you need a laptop, you need, say, accounts on different websites. So for example, Slack is a resource for this cohort, uh, so to say. We are using Slack to communicate, we are using email to communicate. So those are those also can can count as resources where you look at okay all the different requirements of a project and what all tools you're using and do you have access to them do you need to gain access and what all you can do with that and then uh, finally how it will be managed so that again is kind of an overall governance question but again it does not have to be very specific but it's still good to have an idea about, okay, if you are the primary person for the project, if you have a big team, or if you want, say, new people to join and contribute to your project, and kind of just, yeah, it can be, say, a citizen science or a public project where a lot of your contributions might rely on people engaging with it uh, in, in a public space. So these are, again, a few thoughts for you to think about while starting a new project. You might already have done so. Then we look at, the organizing of a project so on the right i think yeah this is one of my favorite comics uh this is uh an artist xkcd you might have seen but basically 
it showing yeah like how uh, when we don't say sometimes use systems or uh, with particular naming conventions for our files and we keep making new copies it's just sometimes yeah random untitled files and i don't know like i don't know about how much everyone else in the audience has done it but i definitely i still do it to be fair i still have that oh i make a document and then i make a copy of it and call it final but then i make a third copy and call it final final so that still happens to be fair and i just end up with five different copies and then i have to figure out okay which is the one that is the one that that i actually need to work with or need to sum it or whatever but yeah that's that's kind of just yeah uh a slight joke on projects and file organization uh yeah absolutely as gt shares in the chat uh it it can happen a lot we, we can have different versions of the file we will potentially look into better systems to manage that but yeah so while organizing we can choose the name of the project so a quick search of yeah the envision name might be helpful so uh yeah i think uh, one of the big examples of a name uh, choosing for a project is i think ols itself so if you look at ols uh, the name of the organization is open life science originally but it when it was started it was open life science where it was focusing and coming from a life sciences background but as the project has grown we have seen that oh ols is not exclusive to life sciences and now i think we have focused more on just like open science in general so that's a good example of yeah like uh, looking at a name and choosing a name and considering okay one what is the current sort of scope of the project but also to think about the future scope of the project so i think yeah that might be something worth thinking where and if you're naming a project do you see it expanding a lot in the future to say a larger scope but it's completely fine to again choose a choose a name according to the current scope of the project which again fulfills the purpose and again avoid names with too many other users so yeah like you would not want to say if you are uh, for example i don't know building building yeah a new organization or you're building a new project you wouldn't want to call it say google or apple or any like say popular name like that uh but again it's it's the thing about oh this this is like a very extreme example that of course like in those cases you will run into like potential uh legal and copyright issues anyway but even for popular projects so if like say you look at uh and think of languages so python for example or there are libraries numpy you wouldn't want to choose names which are trademarks already or you do, do not want to names which are again controversial or as the slide says embarrassing again like that's that's subjective but yeah you want to choose a name which is relevant to the project but also nothing uh too common uh yeah or nothing that is like okay that might confuse the people so again this this i think like yeah uh, we go a lot into it and it's not it's not very very again uh i would say it's not that big of a deal as in as in like yeah it is an important question but it's not the end of the world if you want to change the name of your project later or if you want to adapt into something else but it's a good idea to think about these questions early on so that you face if you face like yeah least problems going ahead uh version control so this is something uh like when we look at the previous slide we have these all these different files version control is basically a way to somewhat resolve that and somewhat address that problem so version control is basically a file management system so folks here might be familiar with github or a more common example might be say google drive or one drive where we have this uh drive or where we have this just kind of yeah directory or i mean even if you think about the local directories in your machine so your c or d drive on a windows machine or your just your general folders on a mac or linux those are kind of just like yeah folders that you think of where you store different things now what version control does is it looks at the different uh versions of a file it looks at the different uh files in a folder and it tries to track them so a version control system is basically a good way to keep track of the changes of a file its name its updates the version control is very heavily used in 
software projects primarily, but it's also used in general sort of uh, open source and open science projects. Uh, and GitHub is like a is a big example of a, a platform that enables version control. So I'm not. I'll try not to get into too much detail about uh, the nuances of Git and GitHub. I think we have a call next week talking about Git and GitHub, which you might find useful if you're interested in that. But one major advantage of these systems are to have a good backup system, to have a good system to collaborate, to have a system to keep everything up to date. So there are like multiple advantages to it. I think we'll talk about GitHub. Yeah, so GitHub as, as a project, uh, as an organization, is this web platform which helps host your repositories online. So it basically hosts our projects online and kind of keeps it all in one central place. It helps us work with different contributors and collaborators, and it provides a web interface for version control. So you can just use your browser and go into, yeah, go on the GitHub website and interact with your project, the different aspects of your project. We will look into some uh, GitHub uh, projects today. So that might help you kind of get familiar with it. It can be used for project commun uh, management and communication. So again, GitHub is a good way to just manage your projects to look at the different milestones or the to-do list of a project, the different kind of yeah tasks that you might need throughout, say, the life cycle of a project. And yeah, it is useful for a project where a group of people are working together. So not it's not exactly the same analogy, but say, for example, like we have the shared document today where we're using the Framapad to take notes and to kind of see everyone's input and to see what everyone is typing and collaborating together. GitHub can be the same analogy in terms of when you're collaborating on a file. So you have, say, a file which talks about the project and I want to add something and Irene wants to add something and Gigi wants to add something and we all kind of work on our own versions. But then what GitHub would help us do is kind of keep up with all those versions and combine them and have like a central version. So like we have the Framapad like as a central place, you can see GitHub as a platform for hosting such files as well. So it does not have a lot of say live collaboration like we have here, but it's a different system, but it's still kind of like, yeah, uh, we can use that for code. We can use that for uh, just, yeah, uh, markdown files or documentation or yeah, just files in general. So documentation is important. So documentation is kind of just the bits of a project which talk about the project. So as the name says, you document what what is it in the project. So uh, documenting, documenting the production and management of your code and of your project benefits, sorry, benefits you as well as uh, ben might benefit if someone else is using the project. So again, we'll try not to get too much into the different types of documentation, but an overall idea is, say, if we have, uh, again, say, if we look at the Nebula cohort and we go to the OLS website and we have, say, the different slides, we have the different videos, we have the different uh, framework pads and everything, but we also have the central site, which talks about the project, which, which talks about, okay, what is going on, where everything is. That is also a form of documentation. So documentation is basically something that is describing something else. So if it's a coding project, you have documentation describing the code, what certain parts of the code do, who it is intended for. If it is a community project, we look at what, uh, yeah, what, what are the different aspects of the community? Or like some projects are just kind of like documentation throughout where like they are projects talking about uh, information exchange and knowledge building. So they're just kind of listing all things that are necessary for the project. So we'll again, when we look at the readmes, we'll come across projects and I'll briefly show what that looks like. Uh, documentation is also important because you are your own best collaborator. So again, it's a good way to just keep, keep a record of things. So it's a good way to say, document your progress, document what you're doing or kind of just remembering. So for example, initially when we're looking at the project scope and we're looking at the project audience when we're looking at the name if we document all that if we say have a have a google doc or any document where we say okay this is my audience this is the scope this is the name that's a good just sort of 
record to have for yourself, a log to have, okay, this is what we decided on and something you can refer to. And documentation can save you from a headache when you reuse something in say six months or attempt to recall something later on. So again, like it's a good way to look at things that you might have done in the past or you might want to refer to. So sometimes, it's, especially in coding, there might be things that you that you run into a problem and you solve it and you get it working. But when you look at it four months later, you don't remember what or how you got to how you got it working. But that's where say documentation comes in again, where you can make a note of it. Okay, this is how I fixed this issue, or this is what the problem was here. So it's a good way to just kind of keep every aspect of the project, uh, yeah, as a record for yourself and for others in the community. Now, describing our project to others. So this is, I think, more relevant, more uh, universal documentation for everyone. So we'll be looking at the first bit more or less today, but these are, say, the kind of overall documentation types that you might come across in a GitHub project. So there's the readme. A readme is kind of the first stop for a user. So it's kind of like the home screen of a project where it talks about all the information about the project. It talks about the name, the contributors, the guidelines, just all, all uh, kind of the major things that you might need from a project. Then there are contributor guidelines. So these are, say, again, for community projects or, again, even can be for yourself where you have a project on GitHub and you want to tell people how to contribute. So if I have a project where I am, say, documenting different types of different temperatures throughout a day, and I want people to log in temperatures uh, wherever they live. I might have certain guidelines, okay, that can you please enter the city name first and then the temperature, and this is the format, and this is the file that you need to add it to. So, but basically talking about all the guidelines that someone, someone might need to know to contribute to it. Code of conduct, again, uh, as we have in this call as well, and in kind of all uh, the collaborations and all the uh, platforms we have, there are code of conducts which we are expected to adhere to. So these are the ground rules that you would want to set for participants' behavior and to facilitate a friendly and welcoming environment. So code of conduct is also something important that you might want to look at. And then there's code documentation. So this is for code projects. It does not apply to all projects in general, but if you have any code, you might want code documentation for the developer as well as the user. So these are kind of just the overall different things that we use to describe our projects. And again, these are non-exhaustive, but these are the common ones that we find. Now we look at an exercise. So before the exercise, I will show you a couple of projects with different kinds of documentation. So here we have the tops project. So this is GitHub, first of all. Let me try to just open GitHub. Uh, okay, so this is the home screen for GitHub. So this is the website that we're talking about for uh, putting our projects into and which acts as a platform for documenting our code for uh, putting up projects. And this is kind of, this is my personal GitHub. So you can see some projects on the left, you can see some issues on the left, and then there are different projects here. So, but this is kind of the dashboard. Now we have the different repositories, which are basically the different projects on GitHub. So if we say, for example, go to the NASA tops GitHub. So this is say NASA's GitHub, where this is the whole organization that we see. And this is where we can look at the different projects. So if we look at tops, uh, this, for example, is a repository, which is talking about a specific projects. So these repositories are all the different projects under this organization. So again, this is how GitHub is organized. And you can see, say, all the different people here, the languages they use. Uh, you can see all the yeah different topics that they have. And then you have uh, the different uh, yeah aspects of a project. So now we go to, say, transform, for, transform to Open Science, which is a specific project in the NASA organization. And this is what the project looks like. So I'll just scroll through and kind of show you uh, overall. So this is like a long, long kind of just front page for the project. This is where you land on when you open something. 
And this is basically the readme. So whatever we see here, uh, when we look at say transform to open science, when we look at introduction, then they talk about what is open science, what is being done here. Then we go forward, they talk about the curriculum. Then they talk about methods of contributing like we talked about. Then they talk about the implementation, different resources. So they talk about their mailing list, the newsletters, the repository itself, uh, and the code of conduct. So again, kind of like just an overall summary of the project, bringing everything together. And they give us contact information, announcements, and then finally the contributors as well. So these are all the people who have made the project possible and it shows okay, these are the people who have contributed in some or the other capacity to the project. And this is basically a way to acknowledge their effort. So this is what a readme looks like. We'll shortly look into these in more detail in our exercise. Then we also have the code of conduct. So again, now I think recently GitHub has started showing all of these things uh, quite on the front page, which is quite nice to see. So like, again, the technicality of it is that we have the readme file, we have the contributing file to the code of conduct file, but this is something that we don't need to look at right now. The, right now, we're just looking at what these actually look like. So code of conduct, again, it's on the front page where we see, okay, this is the code of conduct that the project is enforcing and we are expected to follow if we are participating in the project in any capacity. Then there is the licensing where it talks about what license the project has. And then there is some security information. So this is what an overall GitHub project looks like. There are a lot of different elements to it. So there are issues, pull requests, discussions. Again, this can get more and more technical depending on how much you want to engage with it. But today what we are going to be majorly looking at is the readme aspect of the project. So for the exercise, we'll just look at the readme and then kind of try to understand it. You're most welcome to feel, uh, you're most welcome to just play around with the repository and look at the different aspects. There's a lot of information contents here. So it talks about, again, all the different just uh, aspects of the project, all the different statistics, uh, if there are releases, contributors, just kind of, yeah, deployments and technical stuff. But uh, yeah, you you can also just look at the readme itself and that should be fine. So when we look at, uh, wrong slide. So we can, I think, get into the exercise now. Now, what we'll do in the exercises, we'll look at some example projects. Uh, so I've listed a few. Uh, I I think, uh, yeah, I'm just noticing Irana's comment. Yeah, uh, I think we got to the contributors list, right? Uh, yeah. So uh, these projects, I think they should be in the Framapad, if I don't remember correctly, but uh, we'll also paste it in the chat. But you can choose any of the projects or kind of like kind of see multiple ones and see which one you like. I'll just make a brief mention. So NumPy and AstroPy, these are both Python projects. So these are code focused projects, as well as Awkward Array, that is also a code focused project, which is in Python. And the Turing Way and Transform to Open Science are non code focused. So they mostly have documentation, and these projects are focusing on. Uh, again, knowledge exchange and information. So these are some of the examples that we have picked. So yeah, we have the links. Thank you, Gigi. Uh, so for example, uh, okay, at this one, I'll also open the Turing way and we can look at what that project looks like. So for example, yeah, there's also the Turing way here, which has a somewhat different structure. So every project can have a unique readme, but we look at all the different things here, all the different aspects of the project, and then they have their main project uh, where the Turing way is hosted. So this is kind of project and this is where we access the project itself. But uh, yeah, so what we'll do is we'll look at these projects. We will inspect their readme files on the homepage. So you can only pick one or if you want to kind of browse around and then choose one, you're welcome to do that. Then you, uh, you can note down the features of the readme that you find interesting. So what you would like in your own project, what you find something new and what you find exciting and kind of just, yeah, have a look at the different readmes of these projects. If you feel you are quite comfortable with that, you're also, uh, yeah, feel free to browse other documentation like we looked at. So there is contributing guidelines, 
code of conduct, license, code documentation, all those different aspects. But again, that's only if you feel that you are done through the readme. But uh, yeah, I would say spend 10 minutes looking at the different readmes and making uh, a note of what you find interesting and what you would like in your own project. And then for the next five minutes, uh, just discuss amongst yourself what you find found interesting. So for this exercise, we'll go into breakout rooms. And uh, if you've not already, uh, I think, yeah, it's also advisable to put an S or a W in front of your name uh, on Zoom so that we can divide you into spoken or written breakout rooms. And uh, based on your preference, so if you would like to speak and talk to other people in the breakout room, you can put an S. But if you prefer to just write in the chat, you can put a W and we'll put you into a room accordingly. And this is overall the exercise. Does that sound clear? Any questions we have? Any doubts? Okay, I don't see any questions for now. Uh, yeah, if we can then open the breakout rooms, then GG, I think, as long okay. as folks are ready. There are some people who have added the S or the W, so I'm just going to assign those who yeah. have out of their names for now. Yeah, uh, again, just to recap of the exercises, looking at these different projects and their readmes and making a note of the interesting features and then in the last five minutes discussing it all with the folks in your breakout room. Hi folks, welcome back. Uh, please feel free to type any takeaways or anything interesting that you might have found in the chat. I think we won't have the time to go around the room to chat to people about it, but yeah, do feel free to uh, type it in the chat or the framer pad. Uh, I hope uh, this one. I hope you found the discussion interesting. Is my screen visible by the way? Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, yeah, for some reason, Zoom is not showing me the sharing thing it shows anyway. So yeah, I hope you found looking at the readme is interesting and figure out some different aspects of the readme. So just as a brief, like a readme should contain the name of the project, what it's about. Then if it's a software project, you talk about dependencies and what other software it needs and or maybe how to set up and how to install the software. Then examples of how to use it. And again, like say in a community project, like we saw the TOPS project or Turing way, it's more about, okay, what is the purpose of the project and where you can find the different things. And then you also have the acknowledgement of the team members or sources of support. So like we saw all the contributors at the end of both the both those readmes, uh, you talk about, okay, who all have contributed to make the project a success in all the different capacities. It could be very minute to very large, uh, but it's still a contribution. So again, you can have a lot of things. And again, if you look at a thing, the different projects, people can get very fancy with their readmes. They can add a lot of badges, a lot of logos, a lot of uh, sometimes videos even to show how to run the project. So you can again kind of make it however fancy or however simple you'd like it to be. Then there are the contributor guidelines like we talked about how you contribute and what uh, information you need to contribute to a project and how you invite collaborators. So the document itself is called contributing, which is uh, in the top level of the uh, repo and it kind of shows us, okay, this is, this, these are the guidelines and the code of conduct. So every project does not have a code of conduct, but it's nice to have one, especially in community projects and just describe the general behavior that you expect people to adhere to and to show people that it's a welcoming space. And yeah, I think those are the aspects of uh, the description of projects and documentation. Now we look into licensing. So what license should we choose? That's that's a big question. I think uh, in one of the breakout rooms, someone was asking about licensing as well. So we'll talk about licenses in general, and then we'll do a brief exercise around it. 
So open source licenses are the basis of how scientists and anyone can use, make, and share the code and software and share the different parts of a project. So licenses can take various forms. So it can be contractual obligations between the developer and the user. So it can be uh, legal contracts. Uh, it can be contracts which are kind of bound by the legal conditions geographically or uh, on GitHub. And the, it, the license might describe what the user can and cannot do with the software. So for example, if we take a paid software or if we take say Zoom, for example, Zoom is proprietary software, which means it's not open source. We are limited by Zoom capabilities and Zoom's restrictions around how we can use it and reuse it. So if I want, I cannot create a copy of Zoom and use it, even though there are projects in which you can reuse the project, which you can uh, use the projects however you feel fit. and make them your own if you'd like. So those licenses basically dictate what you can do with the project. And again, so who you may distribute it to. So sometimes it restricts, okay, you can distribute it to everyone. You can uh, not pass it forward or like, yeah, it can put restriction on what kind of license you need to soft, you need to put on your software as well, or what kind of license dictates your project. And sometimes it's about also the length where it can dictate, okay, again, if we look at, say, subscription models, for example, so if we pay for Zoom for, say, a couple of months, that's the only length of time that we will have access to the software, or that's the only length of the time we can use a project, so to say. So these are the general examples of licenses. So this is not necessarily what happens in open science projects, but this is overall, okay, across all projects, which can be open science, non-open science, for-profit, commercial, anything, basically. Now, as we're talking about, like things can be open and closed, and openness is a spectrum. So I think the NASA TOPS curriculum has this very nice image where it talks about, yeah, like openness does not have to be just like binary, where it's not, oh, it's open or closed. It is kind of a spectrum where you can be more open or more closed depending on certain things. Certain projects might be open, but they might restrict how much time the user has the rights for, or they can restrict what kind of things that the user can do with the software. Or some things are completely open where you can kind of reuse it however you see fit, and you can just basically make it your own however you want to. And then you have closed software, which basically does not give users the right to yeah reproduce or reuse or yeah do further things with the software. So it can be a spectrum, it can range anywhere between completely open to completely closed. There are certain types of software, so uh, licenses, which are public domain, which is for anyone to use. We have the less general domain, which is, uh, which can link to open source libraries and code can be licensed under license types. Then there is permissive. So permissive licenses are basically, which gives user wide, but not complete latitude. So as we said, it's a spectrum. Permissive are somewhat like yeah, in the in, on the open side of the spectrum, but not completely where it okay, it gives users wide permissions, but not complete permissions. Then we have non-permissive ones where it allows users to reuse, but can also give uh, users the responsibility to share their changes with the community. So non-permissive again can restrict users in certain ways and tell you impose some responsibility on users in terms of, okay, if you are using it, this is how you need to share it. Then copyleft is a good example of kind of carried forward licenses where it's like uh, some some projects can be distributed modified if the code is licensed under the same license. So for example, if I have a license which describes this is how I use the software, I will also impose it on someone else using that software if they want to redistribute it, that they have to use the same license. And then there's proprietary, which is, it cannot be copied, modified, or distributed, which is an example of kind of all the commercial software we use. Uh, so two major type of open source licenses are the permissive ones. So permissive license are uh, licenses that guarantee freedom to use, modify, and redistribute. An example of this is the Apache 2.0 license by the Apache Software Foundation. And permissive licenses are kind of very popular in open source projects and the Apache 2 license is a very 
wide and popular permissive license that you might come across in projects. And then there are protective copyleft licenses, so which are which grant freedom over copies of the work, but they require, again, as I said, the same rights to be preserved in derivative work. So what this basically means is that people need to distribute it under the same software going ahead in the future. And then this allows user to share, uh, to share the project, but it has to be the same license. GPL, general public license, is a common example of one such license that you might come across on GitHub or across different projects which ensures the freedom and responsibility to share changes with the community with the same license. So these are some examples of the licenses. So for example, we are looking at CC licenses, which are more oriented towards content in uh, say the calls we have or the frame pad we have. So there are software licenses, there are content licenses, and there are also data licenses. Now for software, the non copy left one bsd and mit are quite popular they have some kind of patent uh, associate patent uh, conditions associated to them and then you have creative common licenses which are usually used for content so for example for the turing way or the nasa tops repositories they would have some aspect of cc by licenses or their own licenses which talks about okay how you can reuse it so cc0 and cc by are usually the non copy left ones and then again, they define if you need to attribute it, if you don't need to attribute it. So it's kind of like, okay, you can reuse it, but you also have to tell, okay, this is where you got it from. So you have to cite it in a sense, or you are feel, uh, you're free to just not attribute it and use it how you feel free. So we won't get into the exact clauses of these because that's something we look at in the exercises as well. But licenses can be very wide and very, technical sometimes. So there are some websites which kind of help break down those clauses, which help us kind of understand what a license is permitting you and not permitting you. And then you can kind of adapt your project to a certain license. So another thing to keep in mind is like some licenses can be changed uh, where it's like, okay, they are adaptable if in the future you want to make it more closed or more open, but some are not adaptable to those change. So, Usually, I think popular licenses work well. So I think MIT is a very popular license for code projects that you come across a lot on code projects around, across GitHub and open source in general. And GPL, of course, is a copyleft license, which you might see as well. And then CC BY, I think it's like kind of the popular one for content in general. So we'll get to the second exercise now, uh, where basically what we'll do is we'll go to these licensing websites. So depending on what kind of licenses you want to look at. So we have the choose an uh, open source license website, which is a choose license.com and we have creativecommons.org. So the first one talks about software licenses and the second one talks about content. So read and inspect those licenses and see what might be suitable for your project and then make a list or finalize if you are sure about a license. So again, you don't have to know exactly, but you can just kind of read through and get a good idea of, okay, what the different licenses might permit you or might not permit you. You can also sometimes use different licenses for different aspects of a project. So sometimes the documentation and the content might be under some CC license, whereas the code might be under MIT. You can also have that in certain projects. And Optionally, you can also look at adding a license. Again, this is not something I think we'll have the time for, but if you feel comfortable enough with licenses and with GitHub, you can kind of play with GitHub if you want. But I, I would say uh, you should focus on kind of just, yeah, looking at licenses, reading through what the different licenses are and making, say, a potential list that, okay, these are the ones that you could use for your project or even finalizing it if you feel comfortable enough. And once you do that for 10 minutes, we'll get back and we will discuss potentially and see uh, what licenses uh, you found interesting. I'll just try to paste all of this in the chat so that people have an idea. So these are the two websites. Okay, so the I pasted 
the instructions in the chat. Okay. And I'm well, gonna pause the you. recording for uh, the breakout rooms. Good. Welcome back, folks. Uh, I hope that was useful, and I hope you got to look at different types of licenses. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, but I'll open up the conversation to the entire room for any observations, anything you found interesting, any license you were able to choose or found particularly suitable for the project, or if you have any questions, something that you did not quite understand or would like more clarification on, uh, we can we can kind of take it from there. Please feel free to raise your hand or type in the chat. I'll just give everyone a minute. Okay, I do not see any hands or anything in the chat. Uh, so yeah, I think that's that. That was more or less from today's presentation, uh, for the open code session. Uh, and I hope you found some value out of that. Uh, just as a reminder, we do have the coaching sessions, uh, scheduled throughout the cohort, and uh, I'll paste a link in the chat for the sign up sheet. If you're not already aware, we have a sign up sheet where you can. Sign up for different slots with uh, the different experts in the cohort and come talk to us about anything uh, about the project or any doubts or anything you might uh, have questions about or just want to bounce off ideas. Uh, I have a session tomorrow at 12 p.m. UTC. So that's 12 p.m. UK time. Uh, and yeah, feel free to drop by and just if you, if you want to join, please do enter your name in the sign up sheet and let us know that you'll be joining us. Uh, and yeah, Irene has pasted the exact timings. Thank you, Irene. Uh, so yeah, that's tomorrow morning. But yeah, that's all from my side. Thank you so much for this thing. Thank you, Aman. Can we have a round of applause for Aman and also for Gigi for facilitating the session um, really beautifully. Um, and so, yeah, I just want to give a final reminder that the coaching sessions are already ongoing. People who have registered are receiving the invitations to join by mail already. So they are uh, filling out very quickly. I uh, please do secure your spot by putting your name. And I'm gonna ask right now, um, because a man is giving a session tomorrow and um, we have a still three spots free. Does anyone here want to join a man for a session uh, where you can ask him more directly about documentation, about code, about communities in open science in general? Um, if you want to, please just put your name in the Zoom chat or directly in the um, registration table uh, so that you can just reserve your spot. After you do that, I will send you an email for you to join um, the group coaching session. Um, you can also just raise your hand um, and let me know um, here during the session. Um, I'm gonna share very quickly my screen to show you how the um, how the registration table is looking. Okay, let me share. Can you see that? Yeah, so I see, um, Henry that raised his hand. Um, Henry, does that mean that you want to join the coaching session tomorrow? Yes, I, I, I can I can join. There's no problem for me. It'd be amazing. Okay, then um, David as well. I'm gonna put your name here. Um, okay, Gibran as well and. So we have already these three spots um, filled out. A man has another session later in the month. I think it's, um, let me go down. I think it's 22nd it's with Sarah. 22nd, yeah. And it's still free. So oh, no, that's three more. Yeah. 
yeah, we have three more yeah. spots with Amanda directly. If you want to join him, uh, please go to the table and add your name. Um, I will send a reminder through Slack as well as by email uh, for you to register in the table and also for people who are not in the call, um, just to make uh, the most out of this coaching opportunity. Um, tomorrow, I'm going back up the table and we also have Virginia and Daniela. Um, this is a later session on Friday. This is at 4 p.m. UTC. Um, Daniela is already meeting with Sahar, and Virginia still has three spots free. Um, if you remember Virginia, she's an expert in marine science, open communities, um, and she didn't mention much, but she also has worked a lot with open data. Um, and in general, just she's just um, really amazing. Um, if you want to join her as well, please let me know by the Zoom chat and I can add your name directly here, um, or you can go to the table yourself and put your name. Um, so for now, I'm gonna stop my screen. Um, yeah, and again, uh, thank you, Aman, thank you, Gigi. Um, I'm gonna start the recording right now. Mm -hmm.